Well, good morning, church. Good morning to those of you who are inside our sanctuary. And good morning to you as well who are outside and as well for those of you who are at home uh, and maybe in Rhode Island. I know that some of my family is uh, watching this morning as well. And uh, so a special welcome to the Rhode Islanders from the Nutmeg State. And um, what is so great, great to be with you this morning. We have a garden in our backyard, and there is a raspberry patch. Um, so I, I wonder, so have you picked any strawberries or blueberries or raspberries? Let me, let me see your hand. Yeah, yeah. So we have this raspberry patch, and one of the things that I discovered in the patch was as I walked down one side, I would harvest the raspberries. I'm like I would pick it well so that I couldn't see anything, uh, any uh, leftover fr uh, ripe fruit. And when I got to the end of the row, I would turn around and then start heading back. And I realized that I had missed all of these just luscious, ruby red, um, raspberries, and so I would harvest them again, not realizing that on my first path, I first pass on the pass, first pass on the path, um, I would, there were things that I was missing. And as I was working on this passage uh, over this week, and it's also a passage that's been on my heart for the last probably a couple of years. Um, well, it, it just has reminded me of this raspberry patch. Um, there's a, a couple perspectives in looking at this passage, and so I want to talk about those this morning, but because the passage was shorter, and Maureen, thank you so much for reading this morning. I'm going to read it again, and so I would invite you to take your Bibles and take your phones and take your bulletins and <laughs> whatever else you got out there. And we're, and we're going to read this again, Matthew 13, 44 to 46. So, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. So there's a couple perspectives uh, as we as I have been just living in this passage that I've come to discover um, over these months. And the first one is, for me anyways, is the most natural perspective. It's kind of the most natural way to me as I've meditated on this passage, and that is that the treasure in the field or the, pe or the pearl of great price is God. It's his kingdom, um, and they are of infinite value, and it is a, this passage is a call to seek the Lord. It's a call to seek the kingdom. It's a, it's a call to seek salvation, and they are of infinite value, and we should do whatever it takes to get it. Um, we're the seekers. It's kind of, it's kind of like I was um, Harrison Ford in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. So, like from a Hollywood perspective, you know, Harrison was fighting the enemy and uh, using his intelligence and using his physical strength, using his own intellect, being the victor. Um, on his um, the anthropological adventures. And it's kind of like at the very end, I could just hear him singing the, the song, um, um, We Are the Champions. So let's just pull it into the Christian world. Um, 
over the years, what I've heard is in the Christian world is to sell out for God. It's to burn out for God. You certainly don't want to rest out uh, for God. And in the Christian world, what I've heard is pray more and try harder and give more and nothing ventured, nothing lost, nothing gained, nothing ventured, nothing gained. To do whatever it takes to get God. And when we get God in salvation, we get the pearl. And we get the treasure. And so that's one perspective. And it's the best thing that we could ever do. So the pearl or the treasure is God, is the Lord in salvation. And I must admit, uh, it appeals to me. It, it appeals to that deeper sense in me of and need to do. It appeals to that inside thing that, and that I often hear on TV and, and that I often read. It's this uh, can-do attitude. In this perspective, I do the verbs. We do the verbs. We are the treasure hunters. We are the seekers. We are the finders. We are the pursuers. And the prize is the Lord. The prize is God in salvation and Jesus in his kingdom. And so it crescendos with, so, so get out there and do it. Get out there and get it done. Get out there. Go for it. And so I'm, as I've thought through this, one of the perspectives, it's like that first um, walk down the raspberry path. Um, it's, it's me walking and doing and gathering and I'm doing, I'm doing the verbs. And so that's been one perspective um, that people have had and that I've thought about this passage as well. I'm doing the verbs. There's a second uh, approach as well. So it's kind of like we've walked down the raspberry path and we've turned and we, we look back and there's a whole nother way to gather fruit and it's that the Lord is doing the verbs. The Lord is doing the activity. It's a whole another perspective he is the one who's seeking and finding not me he's the one who's giving and paying and sacrificing not me and he joyfully gets and keeps the treasure and he is the active one and i'm the passive recipient of what he's doing and the cost and the work of salvation and, and is god's alone Said another way, Christ plus nothing is everything. But like I said, the first path appeals to me because inside of me is a Harrison Ford or a Dwayne Johnson. I mean, just clearly this is Dwayne Johnson. And so, um, you know, and I must admit that this second perspective it's just, it's not natural for me. I want to do the verbs. I want to be the victor. I want to be the champion. It's, it's not natural for me to see it that way. And, and how about you this morning? How is it natural for you? How have you understood these couple of parables side by side. Well, in Lutheran theology, it would be called a theology of the cross. It's when God is doing the verbs. In Lutheran theology, when I'm doing the verbs, when my philosophy and my theology and my approach to Christian ministry is me-centered and I'm doing the, doing the verbs, then it would be called a theology of glory. And so I wonder, do you find yourself 
hesitating to believe that you are the pearl, that you are the hidden treasure, and that it's the Lord who is pursuing you. I, I, I hesitate to believe that. But the good news is you are the pearl. The good news is that you are the treasure, the hidden treasure. I can hear you say, I can just hear you say, but I don't feel like a pearl. I can hear you say, I actually feel like a failure. And I would say, well, indeed, you are a failure. And I would say, indeed, that I am a failure as well. I fail God every day in my thoughts and in my words and in my deeds. I fail. I don't pray like I should. And I don't share the Lord like I should. And my mind doesn't go to places that honors the Lord like I should. And I don't treat my neighbor like myself as I should. And I do not love the Lord my God, with all of my heart, soul, and, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. I don't. I'm a failure. But the Lord has come to earth for the failures, church. You are the pearl. No, indeed, God has created you, but there is no intrinsic value in you that would cause you to be worthy of, of the cross of Christ coming for you, except that God is love. That's who he is. It's, it's, what his, it's, it's what his nature is. Scripture is clear that, that we are conceived in sin, Psalm 51. Scripture is clear in Jeremiah 17, 9. It's so clear that the heart is deceitfully sick and desperately wicked. And why is it that inside of me, I want to see myself as the champion? Why is it that I want to see myself as the victor? And I was talking to a friend of mine recently, and this is a, a Christian lady. This is a lady who knows the Lord, and she is, she is so gracious. She's, she's disgustingly gracious. And she said that she was driving down the road and there was a person who was tailgating her and she said, uh, I tapped my brakes. Uh, yeah. And here's this, this is a godly woman who failed. But the Lord came for those who fail. And Isaiah 64 says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And in Hebrew, this idea of rags has to do with menstrual cloths. That is how broken we are. And Romans 3 says that there's none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 6 says that the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. You see, I, I'm a failure. But the Lord has come for failures. The Lord has come to earth for those who need a physician, who need a healer. God has come to earth for those who need a provider. And our healer, and our forgiver, and our provider is the Lord Jesus Christ. Early in the history of praise, this is a long, long time ago, there was this talk as before there was um, this property, before we purchased the property and built the building, and we were meeting in West Hotland in the, um, in the library building up there. And, and one, of the, one of the gals said, um, I feel like a misfit. And initially I thought, 
No, you're not a misfit. And then she said, I think that we're all misfits. And the Lord has gathered us together to work in our lives. And as time went on, I never forgot that. And indeed, we are misfits and broken people who need Christ. One of my favorite chapters uh, in all of the Bible is Ephesians chapter 2. And um, this is really reflected in our catechism in the Apostles' Creed. For those of you who have taken confirmation, maybe I could call you up and, and give you a little quiz on the third article. Uh, uh, no, you don't want to come forward. And, okay. But I love the third article in the Apostles' Creed. Just listen to this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. But now listen. So, and then it goes on and says, now what does it mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength. Don't you love that? Like the shackles fall off. Like I don't have to try to be something that I'm really not. The shackles fall off because it's all about the Lord. It's not about me trying to live a life in, that I can't live and try harder. And I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in a true faith. I love this, like the shackles fall off because I can just be me. And believe me, I'm not Dwayne Johnson. A sinner. Saved by, saved by grace. In Ephesians 2, one of my favorite passages begins in verse 1 with saying that that we are spiritually dead. So years ago, this is probably eight years ago now, uh, so this is an iPod, and it's, um, and it's in rice, high-quality rice. About eight years ago, um, so let's see, how many of you listen to an iPod? One, uh, two, two and a half, do I have three? Do I have three? Four, 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 yes. So, I was listening to, my, to the iPod, and uh, the friend that I was visiting had a swimming pool, and so I went down and caught some sun. And then I jumped into the, and I had the iPod in my pocket and trunks pocket and the buds in, and then I, I was hot, and so I jumped in the water. And suddenly I felt this heavy thing on my leg, and I realized, my iPod is in my pocket. So I hopped out. And uh, <laughs> freestyle, and uh, out, and um, I should have done this, but I put my earpods in, and I turned my iPod on, and, and this is what it said. <laughs> so his friend said, "Oh, don't worry about a thing. Put it in rice, quality rice." Ladies and gentlemen, this has been in, eight, in quality rice for eight years, and the, th and the thing is still belly up. It is dead. Yeah. That's what Ephesians 2 says to us in ourselves, that we are spiritually dead outside of Christ. And so Ephesians 2, verse 1 says that we're spiritually dead. Verse 2 says that we follow the devil. And verse 3 says that we're disobedient, gratifying the, our flesh and our minds. Wow, what a dark, that's the bad news. What a, what a dark picture of who we are. You don't usually hear this on TV news. And I think that one of the reasons why we have such social unrest why there is such burning and pillaging 
and resisting authority is because we are fallen in our nature. And like Adam and Eve, there are many in our country that want to be God. They want to be the authority. And the deeper problem that we have, it, it isn't a political problem that we have. It's not an emotional problem that we have as a nation. It is a spiritual problem. And the problem is that we're lost in our trespasses and sins. It's not a mayor problem. It's not a governor problem. It's a spiritual problem. That's the deeper issue that we never hear talked about. But I love, uh, so though there's, though there's the, the dark news, the bad news, I love this pivot point in verse 4. Uh, and so this morning, just hear the good news of the gospel church. And this, is, and this is good news that you can share with your mom and with your dad and with your brother and your sister. And for those of you that are going into counseling, this, this is the good news that you can share with people that, that you're connecting with and with your neighbor and with your boss and people with whom you work. Here's the good news. But God, in verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. Oh, church, but God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of, not of works, lest any person should boast. That is the wonderful good news of the gospel. That is God's promise that through faith in Christ, God makes us alive in Christ. God, God has life for you. Through the, through the promise of the gospel. So, in church, um, be encouraged today. Be encouraged today. That though your sins be as scarlet, they will be whiter than snow. Church, be encouraged with the gospel today. That if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, be encouraged today that on the basis of what God says, your sins are forgiven. Not because of anything that's in me, not because of any authority that I have, but based on the word of God, that your sins are forgiven. And he promises to never remember them again. Church, hear it again. Your sins are forgiven. And so as I bring things to a close, do you remember that story in the New Testament about Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man, a, little, a wee little man was he, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. That's all I can remember about that story. And so there's this little guy up in a tree, and, the, and he knew that the Lord was coming. And the Lord said to him, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your home today. And as the Lord was with Zacchaeus, a tax collector, a man who was hated uh, by society, the Lord in, went to the home of this sinner. And God saved him. And the Lord said, that salvation has come to your home today. Church, salvation, I trust, has come to your home today. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so remember this, you are the God's hidden treasure. Remember this, that you are God's pearl. In Jesus' name, amen.